Welcome to the Evolution Show. I'm Johan Landgren. I hope you're doing great. If you're new to the show, I'm a full-time investor and writer in sustainable tech. And on the Evolution Show, we bring inspiring guests and conversations to talk about smart energy solutions, electric transports, AI, and how to combat the climate crisis. In the previous episode, I talked with my friend Ron Swenson, a real solar guru, serial entrepreneur and inventor from California. And Ron shared some of his decades of experience as a true solar pioneer for residential and larger installations of different kinds of smart solar installations in the United States, including many smart energy solutions for housing. I really encourage you to check out that episode. He has inspired me a lot over the years. And today I have the honor to have another amazing guest on the Evolution Show. How about one of the world's leading energy experts, Arthur Berman? Arthur Berman is a smart and open-minded guy. So be sure to listen carefully when we discuss the changing energy markets, including our fossil energy dependence and the spiking energy prices. For those who don't know Arthur Berman, he is a frequent guest in everything from Wall Street Journal, CNBC, Financial Times, CNN, and many more major US news outlets. Berman is also a frequent guest on Macro Voices, one of the biggest and most popular financial podcasts in the world, and a contributor in Forbes magazine. So stick around, you definitely don't want to miss today's episode. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Arthur as much as I did. And if you do, help support the show by hitting the thumbs up button and consider subscribing. As always, stay ahead of the curve and stay electric. This is the Evolution Show. Welcome to the Evolution Show, Arthur Berman. Very nice to be here. Thank you. How is Texas? Um, it's it's been cool, but uh, we have very warm uh, winters generally in December, January. So this is. This is the best time of year to be in a place like Texas. <laughs> yeah, I have to ask you because we're talking about energy and here where I am in Sweden, it's 10 below Celsius. So yeah, and uh, we're going co to come back to that, the energy crisis. But uh, first of all, for people who don't know you, uh, I would describe you as a uh, world-class energy expert. And uh, in particular, you're a geologist with 42 years of experience in the gas and oil sector. And uh, I actually learned about you when I was attending um, an energy conference back in 2010 and 2011, where you won were one of the keynote speakers. And uh, I was struck by how clear you described the situation, you know, how an oil field was working. And, and it was kind of, a, you know, uh, a new uh, easy, a way for me into this world, understanding the energy market um, from a whole new perspective. And... Uh, so we're going to talk more about that, uh, your, your expertise in this area. And uh, for those who do not know you, know you, uh, you have a wealth of knowledge in this field. Um, aside from being a geologist, you're also interviewed and in, have been interviewed in a lot of US magazines and TV shows, like I can mention Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal, for example, CNBC and many more commenting uh, on the, as an expert on, on the energy market. And uh, you're also a frequent guest in the, one of the world's most popular podcasts, actually, on energy and investing called Macro Voices, which is, for me, one of the a personal favorite of mine when it comes to podcasts. Uh, Eric Townsend, and, and he has a lot of, um, I mean, the host, he has a lot of interesting guests, and you are one of them. And, yeah, and I also just mentioned that you are... Um, a contributor to the famous magazine Forbes magazine in the United States, which I also read frequently when it comes to different tech companies and so on. They're really interesting um, magazine. And finally, uh, your expertise is also, uh, you know, you, free in high demand. Uh, you are a keynote um, speaker at different uh, for different companies and international com uh, conferences. So yeah, so that's a little bit about you. But if we start with your background. Could you tell us a little bit about why did you become a geologist and how perhaps would you describe your work today? That's a good question. And I became a geologist because um, uh, the earth interests me. Um, I'm a 
Um, I'm a, a naturalist, an environmentalist, a conservationist. Um, when I was, before I became a geologist, I lived high in the mountains in uh, the Western United States. I worked out outdoors all the time. So uh, my interest was in the things around me. And that was my primary motivation for studying geology later on in graduate school when I was uh, about to graduate. Um, most of the good jobs were in the oil and gas business. I was skeptical um, about whether that was the right place for me, but I thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, it interested me more than I imagined. And uh, here I am 42, 43 years later, still doing that. But a, a point I'd like to make for all of your listeners is that uh, I am a, a working petroleum geologist, that my, my job is not uh, doing uh, analysis of markets, although I do plenty of that. That's not my primary job. My primary job is making maps, studying uh, the subsurface, uh, helping my clients to determine where to drill wells, um, help them understand uh, what happened when we drilled those wells. So uh, I have a, uh, I guess, a, a unique perspective among uh, most of the analysts that I respect and, and, and read and listen to and that uh, I'm actually in this business on, on a daily basis. And that, 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 that it, it doesn't make me better. Um, it just makes me, makes me different. And so today, as you mentioned, uh, most of my work is uh, consulting with mostly small companies in the oil and gas industry. But a lot of it is also uh, working with various uh, investment funds, portfolio managers, investment banks who are trying to understand uh, commodity markets and how oil and gas fits into those and what sorts of price trends, demand, supply trends. And uh, I, I can't talk about anything about the earth without uh, saying the climate and climate change and uh, the ecosystem is uh, crucial to uh, to all of these things. And, and so while I am not a climate scientist, um, I am an earth scientist and, and, and know a bit about uh, about the effects of uh, of energy consumption on on the ecosystem. So um, geology is a big subject. Uh, I don't know all of it, but uh, it seems to expand all the time. And that's that's the reason that I've enjoyed it for all these years. And I think it's really interesting that you have kind of your foot in the in, in two uh, two different worlds at the same time, so to speak. I mean, you're both geologists and you understand the oil and, and gas market and, and and the physics of it, so to speak. But you also understand environmentalist. Yes, sorry, yeah. Uh, so so you you see the both worlds and you 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 realize the challenges we, we face with the, your fossil dependence going forward. So I thought we could just for people who are not so familiar with the energy crisis and the energy market in general, we could start kind of a little bit just about the big picture. Our energy consumption today, uh, it's basically, it's concentrated uh, in, in the fossil fuel energy. I mean, it's um, according to the latest figure from BP Statistical Review, which is uh, looking back at 2020, uh, it's about 83% that is fossil uh, energy based. And uh, uh, number one is 31% uh, is oil. So, but uh, even uh, with that, I mean, uh, the world is changing and it's uh, going towards renewables. But do you expect, if we focus a little bit on the fossil um, part uh, of the energy consumption to start with, uh, do you expect that the global energy consumption will be able to pick up in terms of, in particular, the fossil energy consumption and, you know, it's, it's very much, you know, um, connected to the, I mean, going back to the pre-pandemic levels. Do you think we can go back to them or even exceed them? What do you expect going uh, forward? The forecasts are that we will exceed uh, 2019 levels sometime near the end of 2022. Having said that, if, if you do a simple projection of uh, fossil energy consumption, for the last 35 years, uh, we will be below that projection. Uh, so as you said, Johan, um, things have changed. 
and and I I read a lot of uh, commentary, a lot of opinion that makes the assumption that okay, well, you know, everything is back to normal, whatever that was. That the pandemic was, as we say in English, uh, just a bump in the road. <laughs> you know, we we've now gone over that bump and it's behind us. I don't believe that for for a moment. Um, uh, now, hopefully, the you know the disease part of the pandemic may be behind us at some time in the future. I don't know, uh, or at least the uh, the frightening part of it. Uh, I don't think we'll ever be free from COVID. Um, that's just part of the the immunological landscape from from now until eternity. But but I think that that the impact, the effects of uh, of the pandemic are not a bump in the road. That that there. There has been, as we say in science, uh, a kind of a phase change um, in in the way that we think about everything. Think about work, think about energy, think about uh, our, our social relationships, and and that 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 is, I think, more profound than a lot of than a lot of analysts uh, acknowledge or or understand. But to your you know to your question specifically, um, there is simply no way that the world is going to rapidly uh, change from fossil-based energy to some other form of energy, renewable, let's say. Uh, these things, these transitions, um, they, they take a long time. They take decades, they take, uh, you know, maybe a century or so. So for those who think that this is, this is going to be some kind of a rapid transition, um, regardless of how much we hope that it is. Um, and, and, you know, speaking personally, uh, I hope it is rapid, but it won't be. It won't be rapid at all. Um, but I think the more important issue is that so much of the conversation about renewables has to do with replacing our current level of consumption in fossil energy with renewables. And, and, you know, we're supposed to feel good about the fact that we can carry on uh, our lives pretty much just as exactly as we have for the last 75 years, and we don't have to change anything. And I think that's total nonsense. I mean, that is, is the, the worst form of, of uh, propaganda and delusion that I can imagine. And, and the reason I say that is that what we're talking about, first of all, is changing from the most productive form of energy, the highest energy density that we've ever known, to a much lower, much less productive form of energy in renewables. And that's not a value judgment. That's, that's, that's pure physics. <laughs> okay, so, so the idea that you can get the same with less is completely, it, it's, it's ridiculous. You, you cannot, okay? So number one. Number two, if we continue to maintain our, our present lifestyle as a, as a species, um, we are completely destroying the Earth's ecosystem as a result of, of that collective lifestyle and, 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 and need for growth. And so to simply replace the source of energy, assuming we can, and that's another topic we can talk about, but assuming we can, um, we have done nothing positive for our uh, collective um, coexistence with all the other species on the planet, nor have we done anything to address the issue of, of, of resource depletion. So I, I, think that, I think that the model that many people have of, of, a, of an energy transition really needs to be significantly modified and put into a realistic context. Yeah, a really, really good starting point and uh, kind of summarizes my whole view on this. Uh, but um, we can come back a little bit to, to talk more about um, um, you know, the renewables and the transition you're talking about, how we can go about it. But uh, just sticking a little bit more uh, into our dependence or sort of the situation right now. Uh, I mean, we have uh, recently we had lower oil prices um, 
now they're back around 66. I looked just when we record this, uh, the, twen the 4th of December, uh, it's uh, around 64 for, uh, 66 uh, for uh, Brent and uh, 64 for, uh, I think it was for, for WTI, the North American pricing of oil. Uh, and so my wonder, I wonder a little bit, I mean, if you look at the future, you say uh, we're still going to be dependent, obviously, if, uh, on oil, for example. But to, to grow uh, the production or maintain the production, you always have to do new investments. So I'm wondering a little bit, how has the price, uh, you know, that it's gone down now and sort of stabilized maybe, uh, how has it infect, affected new investments? For example, in the shale oil industry. And uh, connected to that, of course, is I wonder also, at this, these prices, do you think that the shale oil industry in the U.S. can make a profit? Can they continue to grow and maintain the, the, this kind of production? Or do you think they need a higher price than we see today? Right. So there are a number of questions uh, embedded in that question. So first of all, um, oil prices at, let's just say, the mid $60 level um, should be sufficient uh, for most companies to make a profit uh, in, in all uh, different forms of uh, different basins, different geographies. Uh, some will be, you know, a little bit more challenged. But but the the, the shale um, companies, the tight oil companies here in North America, uh, they tell um, uh, you know the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve Bank that basically they can you know they're making money at at fifty five dollars per barrel. So. Uh, you know that 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 should be a comfortable margin. Now, having said that, um, uh, they they seem to lie a lot <laughs> about their uh, you know what what the, well I mean they they they've said they're profitable, hugely profitable for the last decade or so, and yet their you know their their financial statements uh, do not reflect that or have not reflected that. Uh, so again, uh, you know as as we discussed before we started the recording, uh, whenever somebody makes a statement uh, of any sort, my first question is, tell me what's included and excluded. And so when companies say they're profitable at, let's say, $55, uh, tell me what's included. You know, what costs are included? Does that include things like uh, paying your income tax? Well, no. Okay. Well, that's, I, I, I wish my you know, my, my, my bank account reflected my income before I pay taxes. It does not. Um, that's the real world. Does it reflect uh, your ordinary costs of doing business, paying your employees, uh, uh, paying the rent on your office space? Well, no, it doesn't include that. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's nice. I would like to have all my income without having to pay for my my house payment and my, my car payment. I'd be, I'd have a lot more money in the bank. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying uh, anything particularly negative, except that you have to ask that you have to ask questions and find out when somebody says we're making money, what what's included and what's excluded. But having said that, um, I think your, you know, your, your, your larger question is, is there enough money that's being reinvested to carry us toward the future? And, and let me say that that this issue of underinvestment um, has been uh, a, a topic for most of my career. You know, we're always worried that we're running out of oil, we're running out of everything, uh, we're not spending enough money, and yet, you know, here we are, I am 40 some odd years later, and at least as much of the time, if not an equal time, we seem to have more energy, more oil, then we know what to do with. Now, obviously, uh, that can't go on forever. But I think a lot of the conversation about underinvestment is is designed to create uh, uh, fear and anger, and uh, you know that's uh, uh, I think that's a, an important strategy that media and social media uses: uh, enrage to engage. Oh my God! You know the world is coming to an end. We're not spending enough money on uh, drilling and developing new oil fields. Obviously, some of that is true, but there's 
uh, you know, we have to look at the big picture. And, and what we see right now is there's a lot more money that's going into oil and gas drilling and development than there was six months ago. And you obviously look at different shale plays like the Bakken or Eagle Ford, or for example, the famous big ones in the US. And uh, if you, we look back just, uh, I mean, actually 10 years from, from 2012 up until now, the production in the US has basically doubled from around five, six million barrels a day to around 11, 12 now. Um, and, uh, and that's why I beg the question, I sort of, can you, can with, the, with the, your knowledge in, the, in terms of resources in the US is, is uh, and, and basically it's concentrated now into, into the, the shale place, if I understand. You have the conventional fields as well, but you're focusing on, on the production from, from, the shale, um, from the shale finds resources. Do you, do you see that it's, uh, I mean, geophysically, that it's, uh, the resources are, are there to, to maintain this kind of 11 or 12 or even more? Uh, you sort of already maybe answered the question, but how do you see this in terms of as a geologist? The world probably um, will not see the same level of consumption again that it did in 2018, 2019. Uh, I don't, you know, it's it's not really a peak oil kind of a statement. Uh, it, it's just an empirical observation, and 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 there are a combination of factors. I, it, it's not because we're running out of oil. I think it's because we are we we are in an energy transition, even if it's slower than some people like, and we 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 have been moving away from coal certainly. Uh, we are moving away from oil and have been for a long time. You know, we used to generate a lot of our electricity using oil. We don't do that anymore. More and more of that is natural gas and, and coal to some extent. So, um, you know, so, so that, that, that is, you know, that, that is one factor in consideration. Uh, but I, I, I will say that, that 55 or 60% of US oil production is from the shale plays. So it's more than half, but it's not all of it. And, and the offshore is, is a huge uh, piece of it that, it that continues to grow. And the, the conventional or the, the historical, uh, it isn't going away quickly. Um, it, it is declining, but it's declining slowly. So the fact that we are able to maintain 11 and a half million barrels a day. Um, probably, you know, we, we may get to 12 um, before the end of 2022, according to some forecasts. Uh, that, you know, that, that, that's not hugely less than it was back in 2019 at the peak. So your question, is there enough? Well, obviously it's a, it's a limited resource. Everything is, you know, everything on earth has its limits, but I would, I would never underestimate the ingenuity of of the engineers and the the scientists that are that are running these companies and and we've seen a tremendous increase in the productivity of individual wells just in the last year year and a half uh, i mean breathtakingly impressive uh, and i'm a bit of a cynic about these things so uh, you know we don't know the answer to your question is what i'm saying but the, but the, the, the history of the last decade or so says that um, I'm not worrying about resource depletion, at least for the next five years or so. And, and, if, you, okay. and if you are, a, if you are a, an enthusiast about the energy transition, the longer we put that off, uh, the more likely it is we won't need as much. No, and it's a, it's a really good point because it sort of uh, turns the coin. I mean, we need to make the transition because the energy, unfortunately, so to speak, uh, in terms of fossil energy is there. And as you said, ingen ingen ingenuity uh, from, you know, the innovation in terms of uh, getting more out uh, uh, of the ground um, is, uh, has, has been gone forward, especially when it comes to shale oil. 
Uh, I was not expecting this growth, to be honest, uh, uh, and, and uh, I've been amazed about it. And, and uh, as you said, uh, we have to expect that it can continue at least for a number of years. So how do we sort of find alternatives? And as you s pointed out from the beginning, perhaps the most important thing, how do we change our behavior, our, our need for, 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 uh, for energy? Uh, because we need to change, we cannot continue as business as usual. Uh, uh, then we, then we, then we will only have to. Re then we would rely on fossil energy to continue. So. Uh...